so contrary to popular belief, having glasses and being nearsighted is not actually a sign of intelligence. And I'm not just saying that because I don't wear glasses and I'm insecure. Um, no, it actually turns out that being myopic or nearsighted is a problem that one third of the entire world's population deals with on a daily basis. It's there in the mornings when they have to put contacts on, and it's there in the nighttime when they have to remove them. But for them, it's just a simple obstacle, yeah, a nuance, a nuisance. For 2% of the world's population, glasses are simply not an option. Without access to glasses or with glasses that provide incorrect prescriptions to qualify for their refractive errors. It can be seen as the background of this image, which is shown on this image with negative three diopter of refractive error. So in terms of understanding what this means for our future society, I got drawn into this um, by my own experience. So when my father and my grandmother were both pushed into having refractive eye surgery for being pathologically myopia, an extreme type of myopia, um, I started looking at my own risk factors, and I, when I looked at the past, whoops, when I looked at the past, it's clear that the actual rates of myopia are increasing ramp rampantly. In just these four places in the past 100 years, the myopia rates have over tripled to 60% of all adults contracting the disease in just these three regions alone. And so you may understand why I was particularly perplexed when I went to the doctor and I was prescribed with farsightedness, which is the opposite condition, or hyperopia. And I, as I began researching, I realized that this actually isn't a genetic-based disease. Pedigrees alone cannot explain why this chart looks the way it does. In fact, we need to look at the environmental factors. What goes on since the 1930s that are pushing our eyes to become longer and to refract light at a poorer angle? As shown by this graph from the World Health Organization, myopia rates are continued to expect to rise till 2050, effectively doubling within the next 30 years. And this is particularly alarming because excessive myopia or pathological myopia is also expected to expand threefold. And this is the leading cause of blindness, glaucoma, and cataracts, all of which are irreversible and uncurable diseases. So, but like most things in life, they're actually not distributed equally. If we look by region, we can see that in Asia, we have way higher myopia rates than in Australia. All around the board, though, we do expect myopia rates to increase. And so this got me to thinking about what the causes actually are. Since the 1800s, researchers have placed a couple theories on the table from near work, the thinking goes that the more amount of close reading that you do, the more amount of time that your eyes physically adjust to reading on a closed space, and the less time you would spend reading or being able to see on an area farther away. To screen time, none of these theories actually provided enough concrete evidence to fulfilly say that we've underlined the environmental impacts of myopia until a, 2000 study, a 2007 study actually answered the question. In a four-item questionnaire, on the last item that they provided on a weird whim, they asked participants in Singapore, how many hours do you spend outside? And the results were staggering. It turned out that outside light exposure as a child, more than any other risk factor, predetermined students susceptibility to the disease. And this was interesting for me because it's very rare in a research environment that 200 years of studies, of science, of research converge on a single point. And this uh, light exposure model was validated in genetic studies with organisms like chickens. They behave similarly. It was replicated in prisoner studies, in studies of twins, and in pure school environments. That was 2007. This is 2019. We've had 12 years to try and implement policies where we know what can actually solve these problems and make our school children better off. Shown above is a new classroom in China, the light classroom as it's called, and it successfully did lower the myopia rate by 12% and also increase the uh, psychological benefits. Unfortunately, it costs twice as much per square meter to build this school facility than a similar facility in China would cost. And this led the researchers to ultimately conclude that worldwide applications are quite limited. In Taiwan, the Ministry of Education mandated two hours of required recess from grades one through 12. And likewise, they did observe lower myopia rates, but at an enormous cost that allowed them to abandon the program. 
So when I began trying to understand how we can apply this research on a more geographic level, I wanted to take apart something intrinsic to every school, something that any school district with a few simple numbers can plug in to do what's best for them and to do what's best for their children. And to do this, I wanted to understand if we can manipulate when school starts and ends to try and push children to be in the schoolhouse or outside during times of maximum light exposure. So in this simulation, I have a school classroom on the left, and I'm gonna show you a basic measurement of the amount of photons at every minute in the day that hit an incident horizontal ray by the photoelectric effect. So as the day goes on, it peaks at around 12 o'clock, coming sharply down as sun sets. So the question now is, we know on an average climate, and I picked to, for a region to study, southern Texas, the question now becomes, how can we apply meteorological data and the science that's been proven to try and lower the myopia rate in a plausible way that will allow school administrators to make decisions to better access their children? And for that, I designed my own model to try and quantify the amount of light exposure that students were exposed to during school, before school, and after school. Essentially, over their entire lifetime, how many photons in 11 school districts with 11 different calendars were students in each district uh, held incident to? And I compared this number to try and see if students that had more photons occur during school ended up having higher or lower myopia rates and tried to expand this in a model to see if we can apply this to every school district and try and do what's best for every school child. So as I play this video, watch how the area in blue shifts as the start and end times change. The actual value of this integral is the total amount of light photons that are actually being subjected to a student's eyes if they were standing outside. So as shown by the picture, if we can manipulate the start and end time to change where the areas lie on the curve, we may be able to successfully design and engineer a school calendar that gives our students the best shot and the best chance of lowering their vision failure rate. And so for 11 school districts in southern Texas, an area in which 99.7% of the constituency is Hispanic to try and mitigate uh, cultural factors, I analyzed to see does the value of the blue integral correspond to actual observed vision failure rates at school screenings? And the answer was yes. Uh, in a very kind of staggering means, it's almost a predictive value. The amount of light that we pack in the school day, that blue region, can actually and does predict what we actually observed over 10 years, that vision failure rate to be, that average vision failure rate. So the question now becomes, given this information, how can we take our calculus model and implement this in every school district? How can we take the numbers on the screen and put them into school board policy initiatives? And with just 100 lines of code, I was able to calculate the start and end time, this start and end time using the school's duration, on where we can maximize that blue area, minimize the green, and give our students the best shot. And I was able to do this using cheap data from the, the National Resource Environmental Lab. And, uh, database of over 2,000 satellite images that keeps track of GHI weather data for every school district in every spot in the world. And this is very critical because this means that my code and the model that I've proven can be implemented in any school district to try and make decisions and end school and start school at the right time to try and make a difference. Thank you.